Well, would you do me a favor and uh, just thank the team again for leading us, yeah. Man, we've got a choir here this week. Seriously. I know it. Fabulous. Hey, good to see you tonight. I hope things are well. What an honor to be uh, with you this week. I sincerely mean I bring you greetings from all your friends at Dallas Theological Seminary, and it is just a treat to be with you. I really, really mean that. Hey, um, I told you this morning that we're going to talk about the greatest story ever told, and it's right here in the Word of God. And so as a reminder to us this week, we're going to start in Genesis, and we're going to end all the way in Revelation in four evening sessions. How about that? Now, let me, let me kind of frame the story just a little bit. I had one of my great mentors of the faith just a few months ago went home to be with the Lord. His name was Chuck Gilbert, and uh, Chuck Gilbert was one of these very interesting individuals. The first church that I ever worked at, I had a privilege of working with Chuck. And Chuck, towards the end of his uh, formal pastoral career, he went and worked in rural Oklahoma. Now, I think I've got some Oklahoma friends right here. Is that correct? Well, Lord, <laughs> Lord bless you. He went and worked at a church in rural Oklahoma. Now, I'm talking the kind of rural that has one stop sign, population 323 and eight churches. You know what I mean? And it was that kind of church, but it was a wonderful church of godly believing men and women of faith. But in order to be a rural pastor, you had to do everything, which means if you were preaching on Sunday, you would preach. If there was any kind of a youth outing, you were it. If there was going to be a bulletin or any kind of announcement, you made it. So Chuck had been there for a few months, and he was just one of these gregarious guys. And uh, he had built a relationship with the kids at the church. And they said, hey, Chuck, we want to take you somewhere. And he was a city slicker. And so they said, get in the car. We're going to take you to a corn maze. Any of you ever been to a corn maze? Any of you? Okay, I see some hands out there. The rest of you are pavement dwellers, apparently. And let me, let me tell you what a corn maze is. It's exactly what you think of when you hear corn maze. It is a maze that is cut into a cornfield, okay? So I'm talking this. Friends, these things are elaborate. They're multi-football fields in length, okay? Covering acres, and they are just, I mean, they are meant to mess you up, okay? It is a maze cut into a cornfield, and all these years, you know, we just thought aliens did it, right? It's a combine with a computer programmed into it, and they would just cut these elaborate mazes, okay? So I want you to see these things. They're massive. And I mean, they cover just, I mean, a swath of, of land. And so what I want you to see, though, is that this is what it looks like from above. Now, when you're in the maze, it looks like this. Okay, it's a whole different view. You know, corn stalks that are like 9, 10, 11 feet tall. And like I said, they are totally focused on messing you up. Okay, so here's what happened. The kids of the church had been through this particular maze. They brought City Slicker Chuck along with them. And they went into the maze together. They spun him around, and the kids took off. Okay, 15 minutes later, they made it out. Two hours and 22 minutes later, Chuck is still in the maze. <laughs> now, here's what you don't know about mazes is that these days there is a National Corn Maze Association, okay? And you have to have these kinds of things. You have to have lookout towers, right? So that if you get in a panic, you can go up top. You can kind of look around, remind yourself of where you are, right? See these folks? It looks like a deer blind to me, but you can crawl up in it. You can kind of take a look. But these days, they're highly sophisticated. Guess how they talk to you today? Drones. Isn't it great? So you're out in the middle of a corn maze, and when you've had your moment, and you're down in the corner in the fetal position, this drone flies over the top of you and says, man in sector seven, in fetal position. You know, <laughs> please get up. Turn right. Okay, they eventually led Chuck out of the maze. But here's what I know. Okay, I'm talking about mazes. 
But now I'm talking about the Word of God. Work with me on this, friends. I promise you, it's possible to be in a wonderful Bible-believing, teaching church. You have sat in Sunday school classes. You've been in small groups, community groups, whatever your church is that calls it that. You have heard the Word of God. Maybe some of you are here, and this is a brand new thing for you. Maybe, maybe you've just come to faith, or maybe you've been in the faith a long time. Regardless of wherever you are, here's what I know. Sometimes it's easy to get turned around in the maze. It's a big Bible, isn't it? A lot of words, correct? Shake your head yes, because it is. And you know what I'm convinced of? It's like going and sitting there in Sunday after Sunday or midweek after midweek. It's like people give you a piece of a puzzle and you put it in a little bag and you put it down in your pocket and nobody ever gets it out and says, I'm going to help you put this thing together. And so what I want to do just for our sessions this evening is to remind ourselves of the greatest story ever told. And I've got some very specific objectives. So if you're a note taker, this is for you. If you're not a note taker, this is not for you. But I have two very specific objectives. Number one, I want us to know the structure of our English Bibles. The Bible, the Word of God. And I make no apology about saying that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man and woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is God's Word. And so I want us to know how this is put together. Because once you know how it's put together, you're going to know the story that is embedded within it. So number one, I want us to know the structure of our English Bible. Number two, I want us to understand as we start the story tonight, I want us to understand our problem and our needed solution. So we're going to do these two things. So we're going to walk through this together as we step into the greatest story ever told. Let's pull back the curtains. Hey, by the way, do you like that? Isn't that cool? I, I just, some of you are just now saying, let's watch that again, please, Kay. It's a, it's a fabulous transition with PowerPoint. So we'll close it up, and it's, if you do it really well, you say, oh, and let's pull back the curtain. And everybody goes, oh, ooh, uh, so there you go. So here's what I'm going to show you, okay, friends? I'm going to show you some numbers. And these numbers, that's not my social security number, okay? There's one too many anyway. But I need you to memorize these numbers. Now, we're going to work on this together as a family here at Mount Hermon. So this is audience participation. So I need us to clap together. I know you can sing. I know you have rhythm. So here we go. Ready? Come on, let's clap together. I'm going to say the numbers, and I want you to repeat after me. Here we go. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. 4, 1, 21, 1. Okay, you see what you're supposed to do here? Okay, here we go. We can do this. I need energy. I need enthusiasm. If you need to, you know, slap your neighbor in the love of Jesus rule tonight, that's okay. Kind of keep them engaged. Here we go. Come on now. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. 4, 1, 21, 1. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. 4, 1, 21, 1. One more time. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12, 4, 1, 21, 1. Very good. Very, very good. Now, I need you to memorize these numbers, okay? You can say it over and over again when you're going to bed tonight. I mean, just lay there in bed, bug your neighbor, it's okay, and just say 5, 12, 5, 5, 12, 4, 1, 21, 1. Say it over and over and over again till it sticks, okay? If you're married... You need to look your spouse in the eye, deep, deep eye contact, and say, 5, 12, 5, 5, 12, 4, 1. I mean, say it as romantically as you can, okay? I need this to stick. Because if you can memorize these numbers, and by the way, don't tell me you can't memorize. Seriously, don't tell me that. You can memorize. We can all memorize, friends. Okay? Memorize these numbers because if you know the numbers, it's going to help you understand the structure of your Bible. 
Now let me bring that up. All the math majors in the room, you started already playing with this. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. If we add all of those up, what does it come to? It comes to 39. Well, it just so happens that there's 39 books in the Old Testament. Okay, now I want us to think about these categories because once we start studying the story, the structure is going to help us understand the story. So when you think about these, think about some words that go with them. Okay, so the first five books of the Bible are sometimes referenced as the Pentateuch. Okay, that is a big fancy Greek word, believe it or not, that means penta, like pentagon means five, and tukas is a book, word that means book, so five books, okay? Now, it's called a lot of things, and you've heard this through the years, and it's okay to call it different things, such as the Torah. Anybody ever heard that word? Yeah, Torah is a Hebrew word that simply means law. We think of that because of the books of Moses. Interestingly enough, Jesus calls these five books the books of Moses, has to do with the author of the book, which we embrace as being written by Moses. God revealed it to Moses in that time period that the story itself actually tells us about. So these first five books are going to be very important for us, and that's where we're going to start the story because that's where it all begins. Okay, uh, The next 12 books are frequently called history. But listen to me, it's not just any kind of history. It's theological history, seriously. Now, what I mean when I say that is that the authors of these 12 books, they're doing something with what they're saying. It means they're leading us on a journey, and we are supposed to, if you can phrase it this way, follow the bouncing ball. There's a particular storyline that they are leading us in, and we're supposed to see that. So 12 books of history. What do we have after the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? We have Joshua, Judges, Ruth, all the first and seconds, get ready, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And chronologically, from Genesis all the way to the end of the history section is where the primary chronology of the Old Testament resides. Okay? We have 512, what's the next number? 512, five books of poetry. Good job. It's called poetry because these books are, wait for it, poetic. Okay? It's not that there aren't poetry in other books of the Bible. As a matter of fact, all books of the Bible have poetry in it. But these five were written and pulled together at approximately the same time. So five books of poetry. We have another five, five, twelve, five, five, twelve, five books that are major prophets, and then we have 12 books that are minor prophets. So if you think of the difference between the major prophets and the minor prophets, here it is. The major prophets are big, and the minor prophets are small. Seriously. I've always felt bad for the minor prophets. You know, they've been in counseling all these years because of their big brothers. But really, all 17 of them are accomplishing the same thing. Okay, so there are 17 books that are prophets. Now watch what I'm going to do here. Okay, this is tricky. Work with me. So we have 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. You're with me? This is Old Testament. Watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my arms around poetry. Okay, major prophets and minor prophets. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm putting my arms around ma poetry, major prophets, and minor prophets. I'm going to pick them up and I'm going to walk back here to the history section. And I'm going to drop them. And I'm going to let them filter out in the history section. Because that's where they belong chronologically. All these books should be imported back here in terms of chronology. Oh, some of them at the beginning, few in the middle. We got a whole bunch toward the end. And actually the last three of the minor prophets. Remember the last book, Malachi? Remember that? So the first, it's an old preacher joke. You remember that one, Mike? Malachi? Uh, the first Italian prophet. Sorry, just a little joke. Okay, Malachi, Malachi, as we call uh, this book. It, it, these actually go at the tail end of the history section. So if you can remember 512, 5, 5, 12, you can remember the basic categories 
of the books. And those last three sections, you pick them up, you walk back to the history section, and you drop them in because that's where they belong chronologically. Okay? So, 512, 5512, the New Testament, 4, 1, 21, 1. We have four books that are called, say it, the Gospels. We're real familiar with that, probably more than any other books. In that section, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? We've got four of them. We have one book that I reference as history. We know it as the book of Acts, written by Luke, one of the writers of the gospel. So we have his gospel and Acts that are really the gospel part one and two. We have then 21, say it. Oh, I heard two words. Yeah, I'm going to call them letters. If you're way churched up, you're going to call them epistles. Okay, the first time I heard the word epistles, I thought the epistles were the wives of the apostles. Because I was like, what is epistle? Nobody uses that word. It's like, I'm going to sit down and write an epistle. Okay, nobody does that. It's a letter. There are 21 letters that are either from a person to a person or from a person to a group of people or a person to a church, but they're letters, and they're written in a particular letter style, believe it or not. In that Greco-Roman, we'll probably reference that here in a couple of evenings, but they're written in a particular way that came right out of culture, and interestingly enough, our culture followed that model, which is why we're very familiar with the letters. Okay, the final book that we have is a book of prophecy, the book of Revelation. It talks about Things to come. But what's interesting is that it wraps up the story that starts in Genesis and it ends all the way down here in Revelation. So, if you can memorize these numbers, 5, 12, 5, 5, 12, 4, 1, 21, 1, it is going to help you understand the structure of your Bible. So, one more time, just for fun, we're going to clap. Here we go. Come on now. I'm going to say it. You repeat. 512, 5512. 41, 21, 1. 512, 5512. 41, 21, 1. One more time. 512, 5512. 41, 21, 1. See, who says the kids can have all the fun, okay? If you can memorize those numbers, and you can all do it, we can all memorize, it'll help you understand the structure of your Bible. But you and I know that the story, what is revealed in the text, is in that structure. And so from this point forward, for the rest of tonight, and for the rest of our time, at least that I get to spend with you, I want to walk through that story at a very, very, very high level to remind us, friends, of the greatest story ever told. And it all starts, as you know, in the beginning. In the beginning. God created the heavens. Friends, these were taken from the Hubble telescope. And God created all that we see. God created the heavens. God created the earth. Now the earth, it was formless and empty. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and he separated the light from the darkness, 
and it was good. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, and God called the expanse sky, and it was good. And God said, let the waters be gathered together in one place. He called the water sea and the dry ground land said, let the land produce vegetation and seed-bearing plants, and it was good. He said, let there be lights that separate the night from the day, and it was good. And God said, let the waters teem with living creatures, and let the air be filled with birds, and it was good. God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, and it was good. And on day six, God created man and woman. In his image, and it was very good. Don't you wish you could have been there? Seriously. I mean, to see the majesty. I mean, what kind of God is this that he speaks the word and it comes into existence? Friends, when this story opens, the heavens peel back and, and we see the story of all stories of a creator God that brings everything that we now see today, he brought it into existence. Now, as I read that little summarization of Genesis chapter 1, you began to hear a refrain over and over and over again. I tried to emphasize it because it's what the writer, Moses, attempts to do in Genesis chapter 1. God does something. He speaks. It comes into existence. And you heard a, a repetitious phrase. What was it? It is, it is good. And God creates. And it is good. And God creates. And it is good. And then we get to day 6. Did you notice it changed? In Genesis chapter 1. Verses 26 through 28. If you have your Bibles. Turn there quickly. I want to just look at the language that is used here in Genesis 1, starting in at verse 26. It says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living creature that moves on the ground. If, if you pay attention to the language in Genesis chapter 1, we find out that God who has created everything, the pinnacle of the created order is now male and female created in God's own image and everything that has been created has been entrusted to those who are his image bearers male and female it's an incredible story it's an incredible presentation and that's how it all begins the greatest story ever told starts with this encapsulated presentation of everything is fabulous it's a great story as it begins, like any good story would. And friends, you know, when we make this transition from creation, and then we realize that there are some great summarizations that we can remind ourselves of. Number one, don't ever forget this, God is the creator. In a world around us right now, we'll talk about why we are in the shape that we are. But in a world that attempts to go right after two things, listen to this, the word of God and to bring doubt upon that and to bring doubt upon the fact that there is a creator 
that he has brought all of this into existence. The established fact, number one, in the word of God is that God is God. And that he has spoken and that he has brought all things into existence. Point number two, I'd say this. What God creates is good. We hear that refrain over and over and over again. That that which God has created is good. And number three, humanity created by God makes creation very good. You can go back and read it on your own at the end of chapter one. And it goes through this refrain. And by the time we get to the end, when they look back, when God looks back and sees everything that he's done... The language moves from, oh, it's good, to it is very good. The Hebrew language is very precise right here. It's as it should be. And then we have day seven. And what's day seven, by the way? What's the word that we use sometimes? Sabbath. I can remember as a kid listening to that going, that's right, man. If I had made all that stuff, I'd have been pooped too. Woo! <laughs> it's not an issue of God needing to rest. It is a statement of satisfaction. God said everything is right. And that's what Sabbath really means. It is a day of rest to acknowledge who God is. And that in him and with him, everything is as it should be. So we get this incredible presentation. But it moves quickly. It moves you know, from this story of creation to a discussion of the caretakers. And while we are given an overview, did you like my flying eagle, by the way? Did you like that? And it took me a couple hours to learn how to do that, so yeah, we'll talk about that later. It's this beautiful story of the caretakers. And have you ever noticed that in Genesis chapter 1, that it's, it's big picture? And chapter 2 goes very specific. By the way, in the biblical text, we frequently see this. The authors love to give us a, a big span, presentation, and then they go back to what they really want to talk about. And that's what we see, the difference between Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Chapter 1 frames the, the entire creation story. Chapter 2 goes into what the author wants to emphasize, and that is the story of Adam and Eve. If you have your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 2. Starting in at verse 4. It reads this, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and no shrub of the field had yet to appear on the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord had not sent rain on the earth. There was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. It's a fascinating presentation. God, as a sculptor from, from the dirt, by the way, he formed this individual's first name is what? Adam. Go ahead and say it in Hebrew with me. Adam. Anybody in the room named Adam? Do we have any Adams? We have no Adams. Okay, good. Then we can talk about them. Okay. Adam literally means dirt. So if you know somebody that's your good friend named Adam, just walk up to him and say, what's up, dirt? Because that's what their name means. It is a beautiful picture of God, the creator of all things, sculpting and designing. And then God himself breathing his life into this sculpted figure. And the text says, became a living being. That's how it all happened. And friends, in chapter 2, it is absolutely amazing. Look at, jump down to verse 8. It says, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man that he had formed, and the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, and rivers are springing up, starting in verse 10. Verse 15 says this, The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The Lord God had commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, would you please say it with me? You will surely, friends, the text is very clear. Transgression from the words of the creator will lead to death. 
it's a passing statement almost. But then the storyline continues. And then verse 18, Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make him a helper that's suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed all the ground of the beasts and the field and birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. My, my son years ago said that. He said, don't you know, he just brought it to him. He said, that's definitely an aardvark. You know, I thought that was kind of funny, naming all the animals. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with the flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he'd taken out of man. And he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Friends, if I can summarize this, what we're supposed to see in the passing story is that there is one command that is given, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the day you eat of it, what will happen? You'll die. It's pretty clear in the text. You know, it's fascinating when you think about this chapter, the rabbis still to this day, reference this as a picture of perfection, Genesis chapter 2. As a matter of fact, you ever heard that word shalom, anybody? Now, shalom is a word that means peace, right? They reference Genesis chapter 2 as a picture of peace. And peace in the Hebrew context, friends, does not mean absence of chaos. It means everything as it is right. It's a great word. And the rabbis reference chapter 2 and they say, man, it is a picture of shalom. It's a garden of shalom. It was a moment of shalom. And every one of you knows that it once existed. And every human being that has ever walked the face of this planet knows that it existed. Oh, they may not know that it existed in a physical sense. They may not know in the story that you and I embrace, but they know that it existed. You want to know why? Because every human being on this planet is trying to get back to that perfect garden. You know that to be true. Everybody knows that in the experience that we have right now, something's wrong with this world. That perfect shalom moment has been shattered. And it all occurs in Genesis chapter 3. So let us move there as we move quickly into this story. It's fascinating to me that in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, there's not a lot of time spent there. Have you ever noticed that? There's not a lot of time spent there. I call it the real estate of the Bible. There's not a lot of time, Genesis chapter 1 and 2. But my goodness, the author gets us to chapter 3 so quickly. I mean, everything is great, right? Think of what we've just covered. God creates everything. It's a perfect garden. Man and woman are in there together. They're naked. They feel no shame. Everything is as it should be. And then we get Genesis chapter 3. Get your Bibles. Get there. Here's what it says. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Now, that's, that's a theological conundrum for us. Uh, let me just ask you a question. Who made the serpent? God made the serpent. Is the serpent in the garden, the perfect garden? Yes or no? Shake your head, yes. The serpent is in the perfect garden. The text doesn't tell us why. There's a lot of information early in the story that the story does not give us the details that sometimes we wish we knew. That's because we're supposed to follow what is presented. But notice what occurs here in chapter 3. It says this, the serpent was more crafty. In the Hebrew text, that is a, that's a fascinating word that has a negative context. Okay, Specifically, the word crafty is used here, and it means... Someone or something pursuing wisdom that is not rightly theirs. 
So the text says, there is this serpent that was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, now just stop there for a minute. We are all so churched up that we miss one of his most incredible moments right here in chapter 3. The serpent speaks. Anybody else with me think that's weird? I've got a wonderful dog at home. His name is Ranger. He weighs 110 pounds. He is the most brilliant chocolate lab that you'd ever want to see. He's in the prime of his life. I can look that dog in the eye, and I'm here to tell you, sometimes I know exactly what he's thinking. I'm like, don't do it. Don't go there. Don't do it. You need to get off that, and we can read one another's eyes. But that dog has never said, hey, look, man, what's up? It's time to feed me. Would you get with it? I've been hungry for the last hour and a half, and if you could do your job, I'd be a much better pet. He has never once said that. But in the text, it says this. He said to the woman, this serpent is in this perfect garden, and the serpent speaks. Friends, do I have any C.S. Lewis fans in the room? I mean, it's that moment in Narnia, right, where she says, you're a beaver. You're not supposed to say anything. <laughs> now, if you don't know C.S. Lewis and any of the Narnia, you think I've now officially lost it. But in this text, the serpent speaks. Listen to the words. Did God really say? What's the opening line of the serpent? To take the words of the creator and to challenge them. Look at it. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Well, the woman said to the serpent, Well, we may eat fruit from the tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, you've heard this before. We don't know that God actually said that. That's not the wording that's used in chapter 2. There's been a lot of conjecture over this particular part of the story. But what we do know and what we see is that this serpent who is pursuing wisdom inappropriately challenges the words of the creator and gets man and woman who've been created in the image of God, the pinnacle of the creation story, and is attempting to get them to trust him as opposed to him. Follow the story. Look at what it says. You will not surely die, verse 4 says, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he Ate it. Verse 7 moves so quickly into the story. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were what? Say it. Do you remember what the phrase was at the end of chapter 2? They're in the perfect garden. Man and woman are alone, and they were naked, and they felt no shame. Here in the text, after the transgression has occurred, what happens? It says they realized that they were naked. They had been exposed. So they sew fig leaves together. Man, that had to be uncomfortable. And they made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, friends, here in verse 9, we're supposed to see something that is incredibly comical. It is tragic comedy. In the presentation. Because God makes this statement here. Look at it in your text. Here's what it says. But the Lord God called to the man. Adam, where are you? Now seriously, here's why it is a tragic irony. Are we really supposed to think, really, that the creator of the universe that spoke all things and brought it into existence, has lost man in his own garden. Listen, friends. God knows exactly where Adam is. God wants Adam to know where Adam is. 
And that is a big, big difference. And from this point forward, friends, it all unravels rapid fire. You know the story. Look at what it says. He answered, verse 10, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Again, God knew what was happening. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you to not eat from? The man said, the woman that you put with me. Now you think about marital strife that started right here. Anybody heard this? There's several things that happen. God goes to Adam, and Adam says, what's his first word? The woman, and if that one didn't take, look at what follows up, the woman that you put here. You see it? He's got a twofer going. God's got to take one of those two things. He's passing the buck. When the blame game starts, it all spins out of control. The man said, the woman that you put here with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, notice this, when when God speaks, uh, he's going to carry out to each individual. Pay attention in the text here. Look at it, it says verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, the serpent, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, listen to this, God says to the serpent, don't miss this, the serpent, God speaks to the serpent, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals, you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head, you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow. You will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken. For dust you are and from dust you will return. Literally, Adam, you're going to go back to your name's calling. Look how it wraps up. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve and clothed them. The Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and to take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he'd been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed at the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Friends, this story that we have just read in these opening couple of chapters are the foundation for everything that this story is laid upon. Hey, somebody want to tell me what time it is? I've lost my clock here in the front. Mike, what time we got? 8.10. Okay, that's good. You gave me an extra minute from somebody else. Uh, Shame on you. There we go. So this is the foundation for which everything is laid. Now, I want to do something, and I want to remind us of a couple of things, friends. Here's what we see in the storyline. And if you miss this, you miss the reason for the story. There is a crisis in this story, and it's this. Sin has devastated everything. If you want to know or be reminded of why everything is so difficult in your life, in your world, in your marriage, raising your children, at your company, in your community, in our country. It's because of this moment in human history. Sin has devastated everything. And I can phrase it this way. Sin has brought In case you have not reflected upon that recently, it's actually a good thing to do. 
everybody within the sound of my voice, you are marching to the grave. We don't like talking about it. We don't like thinking about it. But because of this moment in human history, we are all in the process of dying. Where there is sin, there is death. Now friends, the author goes to great lengths to help us see how bad this crisis is. Friends, if I had time, I would take you chapter by chapter and let you see that this is the point of the story. The author wants us to know how bad it really is. Do you know what happens in Genesis chapter 4? Come on, you know your Bibles. What happens? It's the story of Cain and Abel. And what happens? Cain actually kills Abel. Think of it, friends. Where there is sin, there is death. It's a microcosm, chapter 4 is. It is directly connected to that which comes before it. Cain kills Abel. It shows us what happens when sin comes into the scene. And it's not just in terms of animosity of one person to another. Every one of us are dying. Look look in your Bibles at chapter 5. You probably didn't spend your Devo time in chapter 5. It's a genealogy. Look at it. Look at what the genealogy is. It says probably a subtitle from Adam to Noah. And notice some of the language. Look at this, verse 3. It says, when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son according to his own likeness and his own image. He named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years, had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived 930 years, and then he, say it, Okay, jump down if you will. Look at verse 8. Altogether, Seth lived 912 years, and then he what? Jump down to verse 14. Altogether, Canaan lived 910 years, and then he what? Friends, it's a genealogy of death. They lived and they died. They lived and they died. They lived and they died, they died, they died. Why? Because where there's sin, there is death. And that God said, the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay, keep going. Genesis 6 through 9 is one unit. Take a wild guess what this story's about. It's about a guy by the name of Noah. Anybody remember that story? Man, I remember it in a flannel graph in children's church. Some of you are like, I have no idea what a flannel graph is. Just talk to one of us, right? We'll tell you, okay? So, I mean, it's a story of Genesis 6 through 9. Things got so bad on planet Earth. What did God say he was going to do? He's going to wash it all away and start over. But he he ended up saving Noah and his family. We could talk about that in Genesis 6 through 9. We could talk about Genesis 10 and 11. You get another genealogy or sometimes which references the table of nations. And then we get that fascinating story about the Tower of Babel or sometimes as we reference it, Babel. Was this, they came together, humanity. This is after the flood. And they get off the boat and they they develop the world again. And they come together and the text says this. They came together to do one thing. It was to make their name great. Read it on your own. Chapter 11, the first four verses. It's all come down to this. Where there is sin, there is death. And we've now from that point forward entered into the I world. It's all about us. And it's not about God. You see, friends, as I wrap this up, this is the first part of the story. And it's really bad. You're thinking, Mark, thank you for that encouragement tonight. You know, here's the problem. The problem is this, friends. We can't fix our own mess. And and when we start scrambling around for a solution... Here's really what's going on. We hope that God can do something about it. It's that bad. We can't fix our own mess, and we're wondering if God can do something about it. Friends, what if I told you that God was already at work in Genesis 3 through 11? Oh, chapter 1 and 2, it's easy to see, isn't it? The grandeur of God. 
But in chapters 3 through 11, where it all seems to fall apart, what if I told you that God was already at work? See, if we had all sorts of time, I would take you to chapter 11 and realize that when God dispersed the people, He was doing that for their own good, so that down the road, He would be setting up the world for the arrival of His true fix. What if I told you that when we went back to Genesis 6 through 9, that you know that story of Noah? Because Noah wasn't any different than anybody else that had been tainted with sin. But do you know what the phrase says at the beginning of it? It says, but Noah found grace or favor in the eyes of God. Noah didn't deserve it, but Noah received it. What if I told you that in that genealogy, chapter 5, there was one individual that the text says walked with God and then he was no more. (laughs) That's all it says. Because God has a tendency to do anomalies in the midst of the tragedy. And what if I told you that in Genesis chapter 3, we're working all the way back here, that we would find out that in chapter 3, listen to this, that God drove them from the garden. So that they would not have access in their fallen state to the tree of life. That that was a provision of God. And what if I told you, listen to this, Genesis 3 verse 21 says this. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve. Immediately after the fall, friends, don't miss it. God was already shedding blood in order to cover the transgression of those image bearers. You see, friends, I want us to have a couple of walkaways every night. God was already at work. And I'd say this, friends, number one, God didn't quit on us when we quit on him. I'm going to make this real personal for you. Aren't you thankful that God did not quit on you in moments of your life where you just flat out quit on him? Would somebody give me an amen on that one? Number two. God does some of his greatest work in the midst of the mess. See, friends, one of the climactic moments of this opening part of the text is actually a verse that I just read over real quickly. In humanity's worst moment, sin had entered, and God now speaks to that serpent In verse 14, go back and look at it in chapter 3 again. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. You'll eat dust all the days of your life. It seems that in that moment, this serpent had been upright. And that God displays his power once again to this talking serpent and says, watch what I can do. And that serpent who had been upright, down on the ground. And God flexed who he was, making a statement to that serpent, that deceiver. And then God says this, and he says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, Between your offspring and hers. And friends, this statement that occurs right here in Genesis 3.15 is the first proclamation of the gospel. The text says this. He, one from the line of woman, will one day come that will crush your head, serpent. Oh, you think you're going to do some damage to him. You're going to strike his heel. But he is going to crush your head. Years ago, I worked on a ranch. And it was a ranch in central Texas. These boots are authentic to me. And the enemy on the ranch was the diamondback rattlesnake. I was riding on the side of the pickup truck. The truck was pulling up, going to a gate. I decided that I could hop off. I needed to open up the gate. There was a big, giant patch of Johnson grass. I jumped into the middle of that. The truck went on around the side, going to the gate. I was trying to cut the corner. As soon as I landed, I heard it. Here's the problem. I heard it 
but I couldn't see it. You see, here's what had happened. I had piled grass down, and I was frozen. And I could hear the snake, but I couldn't see it. Rule number one, when you're in that situation, always find out where your enemy is. So I froze. I'm waiting to see. And then I felt him. He was directly under my feet. The grass had pinned him down. I looked down, and I could see a little corner of his diamondback scales. I had two choices to make. Number one, I could attempt to jump. The grass is all surrounding me. I'd pinned it down. I could try to jump. But knowing that I would likely fall and have my legs exposed to the snake, I didn't go with option number one. I went with option number two. Option number two was this. Beat the living daylights out of that snake. And I started just going crazy, man, on the moment. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. I was going, ah! And I was hitting, and I was hitting pieces of that animal's flesh began to come up and sling everywhere. I severed his head from his body. After I had regained my composure, (laughs) that's when I felt it. Thump, thump. Thump, thump. Thump, thump. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I got bit by the snake. I did not. I beat that snake so hard that I severed a tendon in my right heel. I didn't walk for six weeks. Listen close. I'd do it again. (laughs) Listen, Listen close. Don't miss it in the text. If you miss it, you're missing the story. This is a picture, friends, listen, of God was already on the move. And he was saying, listen, one day, one day, someone is going to come through the line of woman. And that snake who in that temporary moment had been banished to the ground, an upright man was going to come through the line of woman that was going to sever the head of the serpent. But listen, we frequently talk about this passage. And we talk about, oh, it was a trading of blows. And the serpent was going to take a shot at this one from the line of woman. No, no, no. It's what that upright man was already prophesied. Was willing to do to himself. And take the pain upon himself in order to eradicate The evil. God does some of his greatest work in the midst of a mess. I don't know what mess you have going on this week. He wants to work in it. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for the greatest story ever told. And even though this seems like a dark part of the story, your light was already shining in the midst of it. And in that regard, Father, we say hallelujah. Because that is true in our lives as well. You show up in moments when all hope is lost. That's who you are. That's the kind of God you are. What you have done is good. And we will trust you even when it seems that it is not. Thank you for this story. You've brought us into it. It is the greatest story ever told. And so with hope, even as we step forward in it, even in the evenings to come, where we remind ourselves of this, Help us to see new things because you are always at work. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.